Perpetual Control Theory and the Evolution of Culture Darwin showed that living things evolved by the natural selection of biological features. In other words, he showed how evolution works. But he could not show how natural selection works because he didn't know about genetics. Later on, we learned how natural selection works through the rediscovery of Mendel and the resulting new synthesis. Richard Dawkins and I, building on the work of George Williams and others, and after demonstrating the primacy of genes as units of natural selection, argued that culture evolves through the natural selection of cultural features. But we could not show how that works because we lacked a comparable theory of cultural transmission. As I've said previously, I think William T. Powers' Perceptual Control Theory, or PCT, may help us to address that lack. Indeed, as I intend to show here, by providing a robust hypothesis about cultural acquisition, PCT may actually reveal the elemental units of culture and cultural evolution. Part 1 Perceptual Control Theory, PCT, challenges conventional assumptions about behavior by asserting that when an organism acts, it is invariably comparing its perceptions to perceptual reference standards stored in its nervous system, and that it will continue to act until its perceptions approximate those standards. The neuroanatomy and physiology of perceptual control is a product of hundreds of millions of years of evolution. The reference standards, too, are products of blind variation and selective retention, genetic evolution, learning by individual carriers, and, in some species, cultural evolution. Thus, the perceptual control apparatus is adapted to early and recent past environmental conditions, both within and outside of the carrying organism. The perceptions which the apparatus controls are, however, perceptions of the organism's current environmental conditions, as detected by its sensory cells, inferred by its neural input machinery, and stored in its memory. PCT thus understands behavior not as simple responses to immediate stimuli, but as the maintenance of historically established states of the nervous system in the face of variations in its immediate surroundings. The elemental neural mechanisms by which normal perceptual control occurs, the units of behavioral organization, are perceptual control systems, or CSs. As we shall see, CSs operate in functional hierarchies in the organism's central nervous system, each CS in a hierarchy evoking reference standards in CSs below it. Each individual CS consists of an input function, a comparator function, an output function, and memory in which its reference standards are stored. The input function receives perceptual signals from one or more CSs lower in the hierarchy or from sensory cells and consolidates those signals producing its own perceptual signal, which it sends to the comparator and passes on to a higher level CS while storing some of it in memory. From time to time, memory receives an address signal from a higher level CS's output function, determines the best matching reference standard, and sends that to the comparator. Unless the input signal and the reference signal agree, the comparator sends an error signal to the output function, which in turn sends signals addressing one or more lower level CSs or reaching outside the CS realm to stimulate one or more muscles. Signals are not generally simple. Indeed, they may vary enormously in the amount of information they carry. The signals of a mid-level CS might be comparable in bandwidth to signals of high-definition television complete with sound. So here's a typical CS in its resting state. Perceptual signals come in constantly and are processed and passed on. But when a higher level CS addresses, in other words, Googles, a CS's memory, it springs into action. 
selecting from stored perceptions which match the address signal, memory sends a reference signal to the comparator. If the comparator determines that the perceptual signal from the input function sufficiently approximates the reference signal, it does nothing. In other words, its surroundings appear to this particular CS to be OK, so no action is necessary on its part. But if the perceptual signal does not sufficiently approximate the reference signal, the comparator sends an error signal to the output function, which in turn generates address signals to lower level CSs or directly to muscles. The organism acts and thus perhaps changes how their surroundings appear to its CSs, in particular to the CS we are talking about. The ne this negative feedback process is repeated at several times per second until the comparator is satisfied that the signal from the input function adequately approximates the reference signal. Note that even though the comparator of the CS is satisfied, the comparator of a higher level CS may not be satisfied with its perceptions. So it may send down a different address signal, altering or restarting the process here at this level. So from this we see that each CS uses CSs below it to control its perception and in turn is similarly used by the CSs above it. Now let's take a look at the way CSs are linked together to interact in an animal's nervous system. A three-dimensional schematic diagram of CS interaction would show the CSs arranged in a number of concentric spheres, rather like an onion. The CSs in the outermost sphere or layer are connected to sensory cells and muscles. CSs in each layer are connected to CSs in layers closer to the center, passing perceptual signals to them and, as needed, receiving address signals from them. An organization of any complexity thus has thousands of CSs acting at the same time, each CS a module in at least one interactive hierarchy. Through evolution, learning, and culture, this cacophony of nervous activity has become a fairly well-integrated parliament of CS modules. The underlying neural machinery can have been devised only by natural selection operating on the animal nervous system over hundreds of millions of years. The hierarchy of CS modular levels is not hard and fast and is still being researched, but the general principle surely holds. Powers' most recent listing of CS levels, starting with the outermost or bottom level, includes 1. CS modules controlling perceptions of intensities of stimulation of sensory nerve endings, light, sound, heat, pressure, and proprioceptive feedbacks for muscle fibers. Number 2. CS modules controlling perceptions of sensations compiled from intensities, colors, shapes, edges, musical tones. Number 3. CS modules controlling perceptions of configurations, particular static arrangements of sensations such as objects and musical chords. Number four, CS modules controlling perceptions of transitions, changes in level one, two, and three perceptions. For example, the motion of an object or a musical chord transition. Number five, modules controlling perceptions of events, familiar packages of lower level perceptions. 6. Modules controlling perceptions of relations between lower level perceptions, such as above, below, near, or following. Number 7. Modules controlling perceptions of categories to which lower level perceptions belong or don't. Number 8. Modules controlling perceptions of sequences, temporal orders of lower level perceptions. Number 9. Modules containing perceptions of programs structures of tests and choice points connecting sequences or other lower level perceptions. Quoting powers, to control a perception of a program is to vary the lower level perceptions to keep the program going right. An example is a routine for performing long division. Level 9 is the level of rational thinking. 
Number 10, modules controlling perceptions of principles, the reasons why we have programs. Number 11, modules controlling perceptions of systems, organizations of principles, from religions to bowling leagues. Now that we understand how control system modules work in a hierarchy, let's look again at what the input function of each module does. A configuration level input function, for example, takes in sensation level perceptual signals and interprets them as a bowl of fruit. That is to say, from those perceptual signals it infers that there is a bowl of fruit out there at a certain place in the world. So an input function is an inference engine. And it might be more accurate to say that an input function takes in perceptual signals from a lower level module and delivers inferential signals to the comparator and memory storage and to the next higher level module, which in turn takes them in as perceptual signals. We should realize, however, that the inferences made by the control modules of an evolved brain, while pragmatically accurate, are not necessarily the inferences that would be made by a team of scientists studying the same environment. We should also note that the evolved control modules can and often do make inferences that could not be made by a scientific team today. Some of them, for example, can infer another animal's intentions pretty reliably by reading his facial expression or his body language, but more about that later. To illustrate how the levels work together, suppose that the configuration level module which is inferring the fruit bowl gets googled by a higher level module with an address signal eliciting pair from its memory. In other words, it's being told to control a perception, that is, obtain and maintain a perception of a pair. Not close enough. Your configuration level module's comparator sends out an error signal telling its output function to address various sensation level modules. But wait a minute. At this point, we need to change our method of exposition to accommodate multiple interacting modules on one screen. From now on, we will identify a CS module by a noun phrase representing the perception which that module is currently controlling. For example, the configuration level module now under study can be identified simply as pair. And from now on, a whole CS module will be represented schematically by a single box containing a verbal, pictorial, or diagrammatic representation of the perception which that module controls. For example, with that in mind, CS module pairs output signals address several sensation level modules, evoking from their several memories reference signals to perceive greenish yellow, perceive pear shape, perceive pear odor. The sensation level modules send address signals to intensity level modules, evoking perceive eye movement rightward and downward, perceive nostrils expanding, perceive sniffing. And those modules presumably modify the tensions in muscles in eye, nose, lungs, neck, etc., adjusting those intensities until their input proprioceptions approximate their respective internal reference signals. From the resulting visual and olfactory intensity perceptions, the second level modules infer sensations, comparing them to the pair odor, shape, and color sensation standards, adjust their output address signals accordingly, and send them on up to pair. In a fraction of a second, after several dozen iterations, pair's input function infers that it is perceiving a pair, and all the modules involved are for the moment at equilibrium. No address signals are going out, and you are focused on the pair. So in the hierarchy, each module calls upon the ones below to help it control its assigned perception by assigning them perceptions to control. Okay, now how did you get confronted with that fruit bowl and why are you seeking a perception of a pear? In other words, where did that pear Google come from? 
It might well have come from a transition level module reaching for pair, googled by an event level module taking pair from bowl, ultimately evoked by a program level module getting and eating a pair, which utilizes many other subordinate modules to get you into arm's length of the fruit bowl from wherever you were, and afterwards to get you to proceed with the task of pair ingestion. To summarize our presentation of PCT so far, behavior in general can be understood as the control of perception. The unit of behavior is the control system, and even the simplest activity requires the cooperative interaction of an inordinate number of CSs. CSs in are indeed the individual bricks of behavioral castles. CSs are arrayed as modules in interactive hierarchies. Each module passes its inferences about the world outside the CS realm to the next higher level in the form of perceptual signals. To control its incoming perceptions, each CS module uses lower level modules by invoking reference standards for them to control their perceptions to. This hier hierarchy provides behavioral reference standards for the entire range of human activity. <laughs>